Ever since ISIS burned Jordanian pilot Muath al-Qasaba to death, we've been reminded again and again by politicians, the media, and Muslim organizations that burning people to death is un-Islamic, and that ISIS, therefore, is un-Islamic. You may have noticed that the pundits who keep insisting that Islam forbids killing by fire won't actually quote the passage for us. They won't even give the reference. Why is that? Wouldn't it be nice to have a clear command from Allah or Muhammad handy so that we can throw it in the faces of extremists and discredit them in the eyes of Muslims around the world? Why not quote the passage for us? The reason Islam's Western defenders won't show us where Islam condemns putting people to death by fire is that the passage in question contains Muhammad's standing orders to execute apostates, and it specifically says that apostates were burned to death by none other than Ali ibn Abi Talib, Muhammad's cousin and son-in-law and the fourth rightly guided caliph of Islam. It's a passage that promotes the very crimes our leaders have been assuring us have no place in Islam, so no one's going to quote it to you, except me. Sahih al-Bukhari, 6922. Some Zenaudika, atheists, sort of, who had left Islam, were brought to Ali, and he burnt them. The news of this event reached Ibn Abbas, who said, If I had been in his place, I would not have burnt them, as Allah's apostle forbade it, saying, Do not punish anybody with Allah's punishment, fire. I would have killed them according to the statement of Allah's apostle, Whoever changed his Islamic religion, then kill him. What does Ibn Abbas mean when he says that he would have killed them according to the statement of Muhammad, Whoever changed his Islamic religion, kill him. He's referring to beheading, as we read in Malik's Muwatta. The Messenger of Allah said, If someone changes his religion, then strike off his head. So the passage that tells Muslims not to kill apostates by burning them to death commands Muslims to kill apostates by chopping their heads off. Since it would be counterproductive to condemn ISIS by quoting a hadith that promotes the beheadings everyone's been using to condemn ISIS, the media do what they do best and give us a partial truth, the tiny part they want us to hear and not the part that proves what despicable liars they are. But the burning of apostates by Ali raises an obvious question. If Muhammad's followers knew that he said, do not punish anybody with Allah's punishment, why was the fourth rightly guided caliph, Muhammad's own son-in-law, the man who certainly wasn't ignorant of Muhammad's commands, burning apostates? One of the reasons is that Muslims are also commanded to follow Muhammad's example, and Muhammad was all too happy to punish people with fire. For instance, Muhammad had his followers torture a man named Kanana by lighting a fire on his chest. The apostle gave orders to Az-Zubair ibn al-Awam, torture him until you extract what he has. So he kindled a fire with flint and steel on his chest until he was nearly dead. Then the apostle delivered him to Muhammad ibn Maslama, and he struck off his head in revenge for his brother Mahmud. So according to Muhammad, it's perfectly acceptable to torture a man with fire, even though Allah is the one who punishes with fire. What about executing someone? Sahih al-Bukhari, 657. The Prophet said, No salat, prayer, is more heavy for the hypocrites than the Fajr and the Isha prayers, and if they knew the reward for these salat at their respective times, they would certainly present themselves in the mosques, even if they had to crawl. The Prophet added, Certainly I intended, or planned, or was about to order the Mu'adhin to pronounce Iqama, and order a man to lead the Salat, and then take a fire flame to burn all those men along with their houses who had not yet left their houses for the Salat in the mosques. Why did Muhammad want to burn people to death in their houses for missing prayers? Because missing prayers was a way to identify hypocrites. Can you think of any other Muslims who kill people they regard as hypocrites? I sure can. But there's a much more straightforward reason for ISIS to execute a man by fire. The leaders of the Islamic State have modeled their approach after the apostate wars of Abu Bakr, Muhammad's father-in-law and closest companion, and the first of the rightly guided caliphs. When Muhammad died, many people left Islam or refused to submit to the central Islamic authority. Abu Bakr sent them a letter and an army. In the letter he said, 
I have sent to you someone at the head of an army. I ordered him not to fight anyone or to kill anyone until he has called him to the cause of God, so that those who respond to him and acknowledge him and renounce unbelief and do good works, my envoy shall accept him and help him to do right. But I have ordered him to fight those who deny him for that reason, so he will not spare any one of them he can gain mastery over, but may burn them with fire, slaughter them by any means, and take women and children captive, nor shall he accept from anyone anything except Islam. Even professing Muslims who rebelled against Abu Bakr could be burned to death. For instance, a man named Al-Fuja'a, who claimed to be a Muslim but was attacking the Islamic State, was brought to Abu Bakr by Turefa. Here's what happened. When the two of them approached Abu Bakr, he ordered Turefa ibn Hajiz to take him out to this clearing and burn him in it with fire. So Turefa took him out to the prayer yard and kindled a fire for him and threw him into it. Now, you may be thinking, who cares what Abu Bakr did? And the answer is, Muslims do. Because when Muhammad was dying, he said to his followers in Sunan ibn Majah 43, I am leaving you upon a path of brightness whose night is like its day. No one will deviate it from it after I am gone, but one who is doomed. Whoever among you lives will see great conflict. I urge you to adhere to what you know of my sunnah and the path of the rightly guided caliphs and cling stubbornly to it. So here's the quandary that Muslims face. In Surah 4, verse 65 of the Quran, Allah commands Muslims to unquestioningly obey Muhammad's decisions. But Muhammad commands Muslims to obey the rightly guided caliphs, and the first of the rightly guided caliphs commands Muslims to burn people to death. By the time we get to the fourth rightly guided caliph, Muslims are still burning people to death. That's when Ibn Abbas suddenly remembers that Muslims aren't supposed to burn people to death, they're supposed to chop off heads. Is it wrong from an Islamic perspective to burn people to death? If it's wrong, then Muslims shouldn't follow the path of the rightly guided caliph, Abu Bakr. But Muhammad said to follow the path of the rightly guided caliphs. So as a Muslim, which command are you supposed to obey? Should you obey Muhammad's command not to punish people with fire, or Muhammad's command to follow the rightly guided caliphs who burned people to death? Given such contradictory commands, why would we be surprised that some Muslims are burning people to death while others are condemning them for it? Or that Muslims are accusing each other of being hypocrites or apostates and chopping off each other's heads? Or that Muslims are blowing up each other's mosques? Incoherent nonsense is one thing. Violent incoherent nonsense is lethal. Now, to be on the safe side, if you're a Muslim, you shouldn't burn people to death in case Ibn Abbas was right. Better to err on the side of caution. But if you're one of the Muslims calling for ISIS to be punished, think about this. What was the penalty for punishing someone with fire? How was Muhammad punished for torturing a man with fire? What happened to Abu Bakr when he had Muslims burn people to death? What sort of judgment did Ali face for burning apostates? The only punishment for any of them was that Ibn Abbas said, well, I wouldn't have done it that way. I would have chopped off some heads. So the message of Islam is, don't burn people to death. But if you do, If you really want to understand the rape and slaughter being committed in the name of Allah by the Islamic State, you have to study the history of Muhammad and his companions, a history found in the Hadith and the Sira literature. But you can get a pretty good outline of the Islamic State's message and tactics by reading the Quran, which Muslims believe to be the direct word of Allah. For those of you who don't have time to read the Quran, here's a top 10 list of the most essential verses for understanding ISIS. In the Bible, Jesus says that God loves everyone. In the Quran, not so much. Surah 3, verse 32. Say, obey Allah and the Apostle, but if they turn back, then surely Allah does not love the unbelievers. According to the Quran, Allah only loves obedient Muslims. I wonder why ISIS doesn't seem to have much love for non-Muslims.
Believe it or not, Allah's complete lack of love for non-Muslims plays a role in how non-Muslims are to be treated. Surah 48, verse 29. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and those who are with him are severe against unbelievers and merciful among themselves. Those who are with Muhammad, i.e. Muslims, are severe against whom? Against unbelievers. They're merciful to whom? Only to their fellow Muslims. But politicians and the media just can't figure out why ISIS is so severe against non-Muslims. There are lots of ways to be severe against unbelievers. Here's one, Surah 4, verse 24. Also forbidden are women already married, except those captives and slaves whom your right hands possess. This may be confusing without the historical context, which you can read in Sunan Abu Dawud 2150. When Muhammad won the Battle of Altas, Allah had already revealed that Muslims were free to rape their female captives. But at Altas, the Muslim army captured certain women along with their husbands, and some of the Muslims started wondering if raping these women counted as adultery, because they were married. That's when Allah revealed Surah 4, verse 24, which says that married women are indeed forbidden as sex partners unless they're your captives. If they're your captives, rape them all you want. Allah couldn't conceivably care less that they're married. Heard about any groups raping their female captives recently? What about people who try to stop the Islamic State from establishing Sharia? Surah 5, verse 33. The punishment of those who wage war against Allah and his apostle and strive to make mischief in the land is only this, that they should be murdered or crucified, or their hands and their feet should be cut off on opposite sides, or they should be imprisoned. This shall be as a disgrace for them in this world, and in the hereafter they shall have a grievous chastisement. Notice that there are several penalties, including death, crucifixion, and dismemberment, for the vague crime of making mischief in the land. Since the crime is vague, Muslim groups like ISIS can pack all kinds of offenses into this verse. And yet, the U.S. State Department just put out a video making fun of ISIS for crucifying their enemies. When Muhammad was completely outnumbered, he had to put up with idolaters. But once he had the most powerful army in Arabia, the message of Islam became convert or die. Surah 9 verse 5 contains Allah's final marching orders on dealing with idolaters. When the sacred months have passed, slay the idolaters wherever you find them, and take them captive, and besiege them, and prepare for them each ambush. But if they repent, and establish worship, and pay the poor due, then leave their way free. Lo, Allah is forgiving, merciful. So kill them unless they convert to Islam. Sound familiar? Since idolaters have to convert or die, you might be wondering why ISIS gives Christians a third option, the option of paying jizya, tribute money. Surah 9, verse 29. Fight those who believe not in Allah, nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of the book, the people of the book are Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. So the benefit of being a Jew or a Christian, according to Allah, is that you won't necessarily be slaughtered for refusing to convert. You have the option of paying tribute money to Muslims in acknowledgement of your inferiority. Is it just me, or is ISIS following the Quran to the letter? But ISIS doesn't just attack unbelievers. Muslims are also targeted. Why is that? Surah 9, verse 73. O Prophet, strive hard against the unbelievers and the hypocrites, and be unyielding to them. And their abode is hell, and evil is the destination. The Arabic for strive hard here is a form of the word jihad. So Muslims are commanded to wage jihad not only against unbelievers, but also against hypocrites, people who claim to be Muslims but aren't doing what Allah tells them to do. The penalty for hypocrisy can vary depending on the severity of the hypocrisy, but when Muslims deviate from core Islamic doctrine, they find themselves in the apostate category, and the penalty for apostasy is death. So when ISIS kills Muslims who aren't adhering to central Muslim doctrines, they're just doing what Allah commands. But what about all the peaceful, westernized Muslims who condemn killing in the name of Allah? 
Sadly, Islam isn't defined by westernized Muslims. It's defined by Allah, who says in Surah 9, verse 111, Surely Allah has bought of the believers their persons and their property for this, that they shall have the garden. They fight in Allah's way, so they slay and are slain. Allah defines believers as those who slay and get slain. They keep killing until they get killed. Doesn't sound much like our peaceful Muslim neighbors, but it sounds an awful lot like ISIS. Muslims are only allowed to seek peace when they aren't in a position to violently subjugate their enemies. Allah says in Surah 47, verse 35, Be not weary and faint-hearted, crying for peace, when you should be uppermost, for Allah is with you and will never put you in loss for your good deeds. When the Muslim community is strong enough to slay the idolaters and to subjugate the Jews and Christians and to fight the hypocrites, peace is not an option. If you seek peace when you should be uppermost, you won't have much ground to stand on when ISIS knocks on your door and tells you that you're a hypocrite. This final verse might seem out of place because it's not about rape or slaughter, but you can't really understand how the verses about rape and slaughter fit into Islam as a whole without understanding Surah 2, verse 106. Whatever communications we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, we bring one better than it or like it. Do you not know that Allah has power over all things? People in the West have been trying to condemn the Islamic State by quoting peaceful verses of the Quran. How can you guys call yourselves Muslims when the Quran says there's no compulsion in religion? But those peaceful verses were revealed before Allah commanded his followers to slay idolaters and to subjugate Jews and Christians and to fight hypocrites. So the most important verse you need to know if you want to understand the Islamic State is Surah 2, verse 106, which lays out the doctrine of abrogation. Earlier verses get abrogated or canceled by later verses, which means that versions of Islam that oppose the sort of violence being committed by the Islamic State are now obsolete. If you really want to understand the rape and slaughter being committed in the name of Allah by the Islamic State, you have to study the history of Muhammad and his companions, a history found in the Hadith and the Sira literature. But you can get a pretty good outline of the Islamic State's message and tactics by reading the Quran, which Muslims believe to be the direct word of Allah. For those of you who don't have time to read the Quran, here's a top 10 list of the most essential verses for understanding ISIS. In the Bible, Jesus says that God loves everyone. In the Quran, not so much. Surah 3, verse 32. Say, obey Allah and the Apostle, but if they turn back, then surely Allah does not love the unbelievers. According to the Quran, Allah only loves obedient Muslims. I wonder why ISIS doesn't seem to have much love for non-Muslims. Believe it or not, Allah's complete lack of love for non-Muslims plays a role in how non-Muslims are to be treated. Surah 48, verse 29. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and those who are with him are severe against unbelievers and merciful among themselves. Those who are with Muhammad, i.e. Muslims, are severe against whom? Against unbelievers. They're merciful to whom? Only to their fellow Muslims. But politicians and the media just can't figure out why ISIS is so severe against non-Muslims. There are lots of ways to be severe against unbelievers. Here's one, Surah 4, verse 24. Also forbidden are women already married, except those captives and slaves whom your right hands possess. This may be confusing without the historical context, which you can read in Sunan Abu Dawud 2150. When Muhammad won the Battle of Altas, Allah had already revealed that Muslims were free to rape their female captives. But at Altas, the Muslim army captured certain women along with their husbands, and some of the Muslims started wondering if raping these women counted as adultery, because they were married. That's when Allah revealed Surah 4, verse 24, which says that married women are indeed forbidden as sex partners unless they're your captives. If they're your captives, rape them all you want. Allah couldn't conceivably care less that they're married. Heard about any groups raping their female captives recently? What about people who try to stop the Islamic State from establishing Sharia? 
Surah 5, verse 33. The punishment of those who wage war against Allah and his apostle and strive to make mischief in the land is only this, that they should be murdered or crucified, or their hands and their feet should be cut off on opposite sides, or they should be imprisoned. This shall be as a disgrace for them in this world, and in the hereafter they shall have a grievous chastisement. Notice that there are several penalties, including death, crucifixion, and dismemberment, for the vague crime of making mischief in the land. Since the crime is vague, Muslim groups like ISIS can pack all kinds of offenses into this verse. And yet, the U.S. State Department just put out a video making fun of ISIS for crucifying their enemies. When Muhammad was completely outnumbered, he had to put up with idolaters. But once he had the most powerful army in Arabia, the message of Islam became convert or die. Surah 9 verse 5 contains Allah's final marching orders on dealing with idolaters. When the sacred months have passed, slay the idolaters wherever you find them, and take them captive, and besiege them, and prepare for them each ambush. But if they repent, and establish worship, and pay the poor due, then leave their way free. Lo, Allah is forgiving, merciful. So kill them unless they convert to Islam. Sound familiar? Since idolaters have to convert or die, you might be wondering why ISIS gives Christians a third option, the option of paying jizya, tribute money. Surah 9, verse 29. Fight those who believe not in Allah, nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of the book. The people of the book are Jews and Christians until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. So the benefit of being a Jew or a Christian, according to Allah, is that you won't necessarily be slaughtered for refusing to convert. You have the option of paying tribute money to Muslims in acknowledgement of your inferiority. Is it just me, or is ISIS following the Quran to the letter? But ISIS doesn't just attack unbelievers. Muslims are also targeted. Why is that? Surah 9, verse 73. O prophet, strive hard against the unbelievers and the hypocrites, and be unyielding to them. And their abode is hell, and evil is the destination. The Arabic for strive hard here is a form of the word jihad. So Muslims are commanded to wage jihad not only against unbelievers, but also against hypocrites, people who claim to be Muslims but aren't doing what Allah tells them to do. The penalty for hypocrisy can vary depending on the severity of the hypocrisy, but when Muslims deviate from core Islamic doctrine, they find themselves in the apostate category, and the penalty for apostasy is death. So when ISIS kills Muslims who aren't adhering to central Muslim doctrines, they're just doing what Allah commands. But what about all the peaceful, westernized Muslims who condemn killing in the name of Allah? Sadly, Islam isn't defined by westernized Muslims. It's defined by Allah, who says in Surah 9, verse 111, Surely Allah has bought of the believers their persons and their property for this, that they shall have the garden. They fight in Allah's way, so they slay and are slain. Allah defines believers as those who slay and get slain. They keep killing until they get killed. Doesn't sound much like our peaceful Muslim neighbors, but it sounds an awful lot like ISIS. Muslims are only allowed to seek peace when they aren't in a position to violently subjugate their enemies. Allah says in Surah 47, verse 35, Be not weary and faint-hearted, crying for peace, when you should be uppermost, for Allah is with you and will never put you in loss for your good deeds. When the Muslim community is strong enough to slay the idolaters and to subjugate the Jews and Christians and to fight the hypocrites, peace is not an option. If you seek peace when you should be uppermost, you won't have much ground to stand on when ISIS knocks on your door and tells you that you're a hypocrite. This final verse might seem out of place because it's not about rape or slaughter, but you can't really understand how the verses about rape and slaughter fit into Islam as a whole without understanding Surah 2, verse 106. Whatever communications we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, we bring one better than it or like it. Do you not know that Allah has power over all things? 
People in the West have been trying to condemn the Islamic State by quoting peaceful verses of the Quran. How can you guys call yourselves Muslims when the Quran says there's no compulsion in religion? But those peaceful verses were revealed before Allah commanded his followers to slay idolaters and to subjugate Jews and Christians and to fight hypocrites. So the most important verse you need to know if you want to understand the Islamic State is Surah 2, verse 106, which lays out the doctrine of abrogation. Earlier verses get abrogated or canceled by later verses, which means that versions of Islam that oppose the sort of violence being committed by the Islamic State are now obsolete. This is a Fox News alert. 911 calls now being released as the FBI investigates a shocking murder in the heartland. Police in Oklahoma say a man beheaded a woman at a food plant and stabbed another woman. Co-workers tell police the suspect, 30-year-old Alton Nolan, had been trying to convert them to Islam. Trace Gallagher is live with this shocking story. Trace. And right now, Shannon, it's very unclear if the suspect's beliefs in Islam played a role in this, but it appears that the victims were not targeted. They just happened to be the first ones to encounter this man, the suspect, 30-year-old Alton Nolan. They say that Nolan had just been fired from his job, that he actually took a car, drove around to the front of the business, ran into another vehicle, then walked into the front office with a produce knife and began stabbing a 54-year-old woman. He then beheaded her. He then started to stab another woman. That's when the scene CFO of the food company, Mark Vaughn, who is also a reserve deputy sheriff, shot the suspect multiple times. Listen now to the 911 call because you can hear the suspect in the background. Play this. So we don't know where the person went. He went through our front office, went to the shipping office, he stabbed a woman in our customer service department. Okay. Can you hear this in the background? Is that him? He's back? Yeah, it sounds like he's running around out here. Okay. And that, that's a gunshot. Got gunshot. Sure. Yeah, we don't know if the suspect was fired because he was trying to convert people to Islam, but the FBI is now looking into his background and, of course, looking into the question of domestic terrorism. We know that the suspect, Alton Nolan, did go to prison for assaulting a state trooper after a traffic stop back in 2010. He then led police on a 12-hour manhunt in the woods. But in the case of the stabbing, police say the off-duty deputy saved lives. Listen. He's obviously a hero in this situation. It's very tragic that someone did lose their life, but it could have gotten a lot worse. This, this guy definitely was not going to stop. He didn't stop until he was shot. The suspect and the second victim are said to be stable in a hospital right now, Shannon, and it's still unclear if he was also trying to behead the second victim that police are trying to figure out, Shannon. Yeah, as much as some folks may want to, we cannot ignore the potential implications. We're going to talk more about this case later on in the hour. Trace, thank you very much. Back with me now, Oklahoma County Sheriff John Wetzel, who was at the scene after the attack. Sheriff, good to see you uh, again. So you said that you have spoken uh, with Mark Vaughn. I want to ask whether you've spoken to his family and how they are as well. I have. I spoke to his uh, wife yesterday. Uh, we had her come down to the Moore Police Department after we took him down there. Uh, she was able to rejoin him at that point in time, and um, she's, she's holding up very well. She's very supportive. Uh, she understands uh, not only his role as a businessman, but also his role as a vol citizen volunteer as a reserve deputy. Can you tell us where the shooter was shot, where in his body? I, I really can't. Um, you know, one of the things that we purposely didn't do was ask Mark specific questions okay. about the incident. Um, our role really was to be supportive of him rather than the crime itself. And I mean, I know that you went to the crime scene. Um, I, you know, there's, there's no reason to go through the gruesome details, but can you describe the state of the witnesses and, and the law enforcement on site? Um, uh, law enforcement uh, presence from the Moore Police Department, from the Oklahoma Highway Patrol, um, was very heavy around the the plant. But were they um, traumatized? I mean, this is not something that you trained to see or probably ever have seen. No, I spoke with one of the one of the officers who was in who went inside uh, the facility. Um, I mean, it it was a horrific sight, uh, and that's really kind of all they expressed. Our first, um, you know, the first concern we had even with Mark was the fact that we knew his training from his training not only as a reserve but also as a member of our 
uh, SWAT team, we knew that uh, the shooting would not be the incident that would draw uh, the most trauma. Mm -hmm. It would be the beheading of the woman. What he and saw And being before. able to see that, yes. Do you know how this guy got hired? President Barack Obama is set to give a speech tonight in which he will outline the case of both arming so-called moderate Syrian rebels and launching airstrikes inside Syria in the name of combating ISIS. And for the last month, we've heard propaganda about how if we had only armed the good rebels, the moderate rebels in Syria, then they could have fought off ISIS and this wouldn't be a problem. Well, here's the truth about ISIS. The vast majority of the rebels in Syria, as Colonel Tony Schaefer said on the Alex Jones show today, are not moderates. They're radical jihadists, many of whom collaborated with, defected to, and gave weapons to ISIS terrorists. It was the Obama administration's policy in the first place to arm Syrian rebels in addition to the weapons they obtained via the US consulate in Benghazi that led directly to the growth and spread of ISIS. Now, Obama wants to pour gasoline on a raging inferno by pouring more weapons into Syria that will inevitably end up in the hands of ISIS terrorists. And in the article linked in the description below, you can read about innumerable examples of how these so-called moderate rebels, you know, the type who like to cut out people's internal organs and eat them on camera, that's how moderate they are, have fought alongside, have collaborated with, defected to, and given weapons to ISIS terrorists. These are the same militants Obama now wants to arm to an even greater extent. Obama is effectively planning to fight ISIS by arming ISIS, which of course makes no sense whatsoever. Here's an example. Basel Idris, FSA rebel commander, quote, We are collaborating with the Islamic State. ISIS fighter Abu Athiyah, We are buying weapons from the FSA. We bought 200 anti-aircraft missiles and concourse anti-tank weapons. We have good relations with our brothers in the FSA. These are the militants that Obama wants to arm. They're collaborating with giving weapons to ISIS. It was so-called moderate rebels who sold Stephen Sokoloff, the beheaded American journalist, to ISIS. It was so-called moderate rebels that Obama wants to arm who fought with ISIS to seize the Menaj air base in Syria last year. In July, it emerged that, quote, several factions within the FSA, including al Attahar, Abin al Qaim, had, quote, handed over its weapons to the Islamic State in large numbers, and pledged allegiance to ISIS. The Syrian rebels that Obama wants to arm in the name of fighting ISIS are allied with ISIS. This is the lunacy of the administration's policy, just as we saw the lunacy of arming radical jihadists in Libya, conducting airstrikes, which ultimately led to Benghazi and the collapse of Libya as a failed state.